Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. Hey. All right. Hey, it's, uh, it's great to see you. Today, my name is Timothy Atik. I'm the executive director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station. And man, I just love every opportunity I have to come and be here with you at FaithBridge. If you weren't here last Sunday, then you need to know that today is kind of part two in this two-week series that we are calling Tough Stuff. And uh, today, I want to have a very honest conversation about the topic of suicide. And let me just tell you why I want to talk about suicide this morning. Let me just read you some stats about suicide that you might not know. Worldwide, there is one death by suicide every 40 seconds. In the United States, approximately 105 Americans die by suicide every day. And my research is really zeroed in on kind of the high school and college age just because that's where I spend so much of my time But let me just share some of these stats with you. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among 15 to 24 year olds in the United States. It is second only to unintentional injury. The the suicide rate among young adults age 15 to 24 has tripled since the 1950s. One in 12 college students has written a suicide plan at some point. Nearly half of those considering suicide, do not tell anyone. Two-thirds of students struggling do not seek treatment. 85% of college students report having been overwhelmed by everything they have needed to do in the last year. About one-third of U.S. students had difficulty functioning as a result of depression in the last 12 months. 49.5% of students reported feelings of hopelessness in the last year. 60.5% of students reported feelings of loneliness in the last year. Let me just tell you why I share some of those stats with you. Number one, you might be a parent of a 15 to 24 year old and you need to be tuned in on what's going on with your child. But the reason I share that is that you might not be in that 15 to 24 age range, but you absolutely fit what that statistic is talking about. Can we all agree that not one of us is above feeling lonely or overwhelmed or even depressed? I wonder how many people in here are feeling overwhelmed right now or stressed out or anxious. And so in light of those statistics, let me just ask you to do yourself a favor and someone else a favor. If you will, just take out your phone. And I want to ask you to take a picture of the numbers that we're going to put on the screen. Because it is very possible that you or someone you know will need this help at some point in the near future. Not one of us is above suicide. Not one, of us is re- not one of us is above reaching a dark place in life where we just can't seem to see a way forward. Let me just tell you, this message is, is personal for me in the sense that my personality leans towards depression. I've actually taken medication for depression in my past. I take medication for anxiety. I currently take it. And that's after a lot of discussions with doctors who know and love Jesus. And I would even say that in my past, I have had thoughts that I would classify as suicidal. I tell you that just to say that this message is for everyone this morning, including myself. So let me just say this. I I believe that everyone here knows what suicide is, but I want to give us a definition to work with this morning. Suicide is a desperate attempt to escape suffering that has become unbearable. Okay, that's how we're going to define suicide. It's a desperate attempt to escape suffering that has become unbearable. So let me just illustrate it for you this way. I'm going to ask Uh, my lighting friends on the back to just kind of blast me with the spots right now. And I want you to just think about um, suicide kind of like this. It is possible for life to reach a point where it feels just kind of blinding. And uh, the reality is you might not be able to tell uh, what I'm experiencing right now, but this moment is painful, it is uncomfortable, and I would say it's probably unbearable. 
It is, and the reality is that life can feel a lot like that, where, where you reach a moment that in the midst of a dark place, you actually feel blinded by life. Life can reach a point that is painful and uncomfortable and even unbearable. And if you're in that place right now, if life kind of feels like this, where it, it feels hard to make sense of life, it, it's, it's difficult, to, difficult to kind of see a path forward, just think about what might have put you there. There's all sorts of things that will contribute to us feeling like this in life. You could have gone through a traumatic experience. You could just be overwhelmed with everything that you have going on in your life. It's possible that you've made a decision in your past that has brought really guilt, shame, and regret that you just can't seem to shoulder any more. It's possible that An addiction has intensified with alcohol or drugs that was fun in the beginning, and now it's just led to all sorts of depression. It's possible that it's just kind of a a cocktail of things where, where things at home aren't going well, and some relationships are broken, and you're stressed out at work, and you're struggling to just kind of make sense of what your purpose is in life. And so with all of these things combined, you've reached a moment where life is painful, uncomfortable, and unbearable. And if that's where you're at right now, you need to know in a moment in life that kind of feels blinding like this, it's it, it, blinding like this, it's possible to begin to believe lies. And so this morning, we are actually going to unpack truths to counteract these lies. But the three lies that we can begin to believe when we're in a moment that is blinding like this are this. The, the first lie that we begin to believe is this, nobody really cares. The second lie is this. I mean, think about, let's think about the first one. No one really cares. I mean, it's interesting that there are a thousand people in this room, but it's just not that easy to see you at this point. And and life can feel like that sometimes where there are people around you who love you and care about you and want to help. You just can't see it. And the second lie that we tend to believe is this. Suicide will end the pain. So just think about this. All I want to do in this moment is get out from this space. I just want to get out. And it's possible to get to that place in life where it just feels like if you could just get out, then the pain would end. So we believe the lie that suicide will end the pain. And then the third lie that we begin to believe is that nothing will change. These are lies. These are lies. I need you to know if you feel like you're in a place like this in life or you know someone who is, you need to know there is hope. There is hope. And we're gonna move together towards hope this morning. But in order for us to move towards hope, we're gonna have to move away from lies. And so let's pursue truth this morning. The first lie that we need to deal with is this. Nobody really cares. Let's just talk about this lie. There's a rapper whose name is Logic, and Logic came out with a song that is entitled The Number for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. The title to the song is just the phone number, and it's a song that kind of details the account of someone that is suicidal and calling the hotline. He doesn't want to die, but he does, and he's kind of, it's kind of this back and forth conversation. And in the song, here's what the person that is con- contemplating suicide, here's what they, they articulate. They say, I've been praying for somebody to save me. No one's heroic and my life doesn't even matter. I know it. I know it. I know I'm hurting deep down but can't show it. I never had a place to call my own. I never had a home. There isn't anybody calling my phone. Where have you been? Where are you at? What's on your mind? They say every life is precious, but nobody cares about mine. Do you hear what he's articulating? He's saying nobody cares about what's going on in my life. Nobody's blowing up my phone, making sure that I'm okay. There's no family and friends that are kind of leaning into my life saying, I just want to make sure that things are good in your life. He's saying nobody really cares. 
There's a Netflix original series, and I'm in really no way encouraging you to watch this series, but it's called 13 Reasons Why. And it's a show that kind of details this high school girl's 13 reasons why she committed suicide. And uh, at the end of the series, Hannah Baker says this. She's the, the girl who committed suicide, she says this. She says, some of you didn't care, some of you cared, but none of you cared enough. What's she really saying? She's saying nobody really cares. And maybe you know what that feels like. Maybe that resonates with where you're at right now. Maybe it feels like there's no one in your life that really cares. Maybe you feel like you're shouldering all of your pain or the feeling of life being unbearable. You feel like you've got to shoulder it on your own. Maybe you feel like if you were to share that with someone, you would just be an inconvenience to them. That you, you don't want to worry them. They don't care enough for you to interrupt their world with your problems. And maybe you're at a place in life where you've even convinced yourself, I don't know that anyone would really notice if I was gone. And so you might have even had the thought, I wonder who would come to my funeral. I even wonder who would even show up. Part of you wants to die just to see if people would show up, assuming that that's even possible in the afterlife. Maybe you've had the thought that your family or your friends or your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband or wife, your kids' lives would actually be better off if you were gone. Why? Because something in you has believed a lie that nobody cares. You want to know how I know that this is a lie? Because I care. I care about you. I don't even have to know your name to know that I care about you. There's a reason why I got up in College Station this morning and I'm here now to speak to you. And it's because I care. There's a bunch of different things I could have talked about this morning, but God has put it on my heart to talk to you about suicide because I care. But it doesn't really matter that I care. What matters is that God cares about you. See, the real reason that I'm giving this talk is because the God of the universe sees you and cares about you. So if you're in a place that feels blinding in life, you need to know that this morning is a message from God through me to you. Not to the general audience. This is a message that God has custom tailored to your life this morning. God sees you. He knows what you need. And he cares deeply about you. And he wants you to live. He does. Now, while I'm talking about this idea of God caring, let me just go ahead and answer the question uh, that you might wonder. If, if you commit suicide, does that automatically mean that you're going to go to hell? And I believe that the answer to that question is no. And here's why I say that. Because suicide is not the unforgivable sin. It's not. It is not the unforgivable sin. But it is is a sin. We just need to be clear on that. While it is not the unforgivable sin, suicide absolutely is a sin because suicide, I don't know if you've ever thought about it like this, but suicide is actually murder. It is the premeditated, thought out, planned out taking of your own life. So suicide is in fact a sin. But it's not the unforgivable sin. And to position it as a sin that is unforgivable actually contradicts Scripture because Matthew 12, 31 tells us this, Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. So there's only one sin that's unforgivable. It's the blasphemy of, of the Holy Spirit. Some some people believe that that sin isn't even possible to commit at this point in history. Now, there's different positions. We're not talking about that this morning. But the point is that suicide is not the unforgivable sin. Now, if you're here this morning and you believe I just gave you a pass on suicide, then we just need to have a really honest conversation right here in this moment. Because suicide is a sin. And to take the mentality like, 
well, it's not the unforgivable sin, so I'll commit suicide, and in the end, God will forgive me. Is that possible? I do think it's possible. Is that the right way to process through things? I don't think so, because to take your own life shows a severe misunderstanding of who Jesus is and why he came to earth. You have to realize when we talk about Jesus, we are talking about someone who understands where you are at in life. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed and arrested, we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and here's what it says about him. I don't know if you've ever processed through this, but it says in Matthew 26, 38, it said, Then he said to them, to his few friends, he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Do you know what that means? It means that Jesus has been right where you're at. He knows what it like. He knows what it is like to feel sorrow, so much sorrow in life to the point of dying. But even in the garden of Gethsemane, What do we see him praying? He says, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Even feeling sorrow to the point of death, we find Jesus saying, God, I trust you. I trust you with my life. So whether I live or die, your will be done. Jesus wants you to live, and he's shown us what it looks like in these moments where life feels blinding. He's shown us what it looks like to entrust ourselves to our maker. You have to understand, Jesus came to earth because he wants you to live. John 10.10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus says, I came. The reason I have come, the reason that I left heaven deserving to be worshiped as a king, but I came and was crucified as a criminal. The reason I have come is so that you might have life to the full. This is the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that Jesus died so that you could live, not just physically, but spiritually. Jesus wants you to live. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your your savior, then you need to understand what becomes true about you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says this, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. When you know Jesus, what is a reality for you is that Jesus' death on the cross determines your value now. So when Jesus got up on that cross, what the God of the universe was saying, I'm taking you who had no value and I am ascribing value to you. You are now worth the body and blood of the Son of God. That is how valuable you are to God, that God would give his Son to have you. And so he says, man, I purchased you. I paid a big price to have you and now Your body actually doesn't even belong to you anymore. It was bought with a price. And so Paul tells us, glorify God in your body. Your body isn't even yours to do with it what you want. Because Jesus Christ has lovingly purchased you through his sacrifice on the cross. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, he says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. This is Paul telling us that God has a unique plan for each one of us. That word in the Greek that's been translated workmanship, it's the word poema. What does that sound like? Sounds like the word poem. It's saying that we are God's masterpiece, we are his works of art that before you were even a thought to anyone on this earth, God had prepared great works for you to do on this earth. I guarantee you suicide is not one of those great works. You need to know it is never God's will for you to take your own life. Why? Because God has a significant and noble purpose for you to fulfill while you're here on earth. Now, you might not feel like you have a purpose. Feelings are real. They're just not always reliable. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? You might not feel like you have a purpose, but you have to understand feelings are real. They're just not always reliable. Just because you don't feel like you have a purpose doesn't mean that you don't have one. God has made you. And if if he could easily replace you, he would have made a million of you, but there's only one of you. And he's made you to accomplish something specific and significant. Do not bail on life when God has great things for you to do. See, you need to understand God cares deeply about your life. To believe that no one really cares is a flat out life, flat out lie. I care about you, God cares about you. Your family and friends care about you. And that's what I think a lot of us want to know. Does anyone around me really care about me? And I think that the second lie that we're about to unpack will show that people, in fact, do care about you. So let's look at the second lie that we need to talk about. Here it is. Suicide will end the pain. Suicide will end the pain. You need to understand This is so important, so please don't miss this second lie. This is absolutely a lie because suicide doesn't end the pain. It just transfers and magnifies the pain in the lives of the people that truly love and care about you. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Suicide doesn't end the pain. It just transfers it, and it magnifies it in the lives of your family and friends. It's interesting, if you were to read people's suicide notes or watch their suicide videos, what's the message that they want to communicate to their family and friends the most? The message that they want to communicate to their family and friends is, I want you to know that I love you. That's the main message who people who take their lives, that's the main message that they want their family and friends to to know. Do you realize that suicide is hands down, without a doubt, by far the worst way to communicate that message to your family and friends? There is no worse way to tell your loved ones that you love them. That message deserves a lifetime of communication. It does. As I was preparing to talk about suicide to college students at Breakaway, I posted about it online, and a friend whose son had committed suicide a um, little over four years ago just messaged me and said that she was praying for me, and I reached out to her specifically about this second point because I wanted to make sure that what I was saying was right. And she ended up writing a letter to the students at Breakaway. And now I really believe that this is a letter to the people here at Faith Bridge. I just want to read it to you. This is from a mom whose son took his own life a little over four years ago. Here's what she says. She says, I woke up this morning knowing somehow I had been with my son in my dreams, but not being able to grasp exactly what I dreamed or remember exactly what he did or how he sounded. The memory is so close, but I can't quite touch it, and oh, how I want to. I miss him so much every moment, every day, and knowing I will never see him again, this side of heaven is excruciatingly sad for this mom, for all of us. He left such a gaping hole in our family, but fortunately, gratefully, in his faithfulness, God has helped us. Without God, truly, I have no idea how we could have even survived this. Because that day, a little under four years ago, that two police officers came to our door to tell us the devastating news will forever be my worst day ever. And to be honest, I so wish I could have done more to help my son know how dearly loved he was, remind him one more time how gifted he was, remind him who he was in Christ, name off all those who loved and respected him in his field of expertise. I wish he could have truly believed how much hope we saw for his future, but he had stopped listening and believing these truths. Taking his own life was his choice. He wanted to be free from his pain. But suicide doesn't eliminate the pain. It shares it with every person who loved you. It transfers it from you to them. In my son's case, I saw several hundred people in pain at his memorial service. 
I just kept thinking if only he could see this large room filled with people that loved him, that came from all over the country to honor his life, maybe that would have made a difference. And of course, I will always wonder what else could, a, could I have done? Was there something I could have said? If only I could have changed the outcome. Our seasons of grief have changed in the last few years, but some of the effects we have to deal with are devastation, emptiness, regret, fear of something happening to another loved one, anger at my son for not receiving the love and support offered to him, shame, awkwardness around others, and knowing that every holiday, every family celebration will be incomplete. My sweet grandsons will not get the joy of knowing their crazy, fun-loving, joy-giving uncle. We have to live with the mystery of all the unanswered questions the rest of our lives. Fortunately, God is helping and will continue to help us. I can, in truth, tell you that through all of this, my God has been faithful to us. To one who thinks there's no way out, there is. To one who thinks no one cares, they do. To one who has no hope, see the hope in Jesus. To one who is scared to get help, run to it anyway. The darkness of night never lasts forever. Wait for the light that always comes. I promise that the God who has been faithful to us will also be faithful to you. My son cannot be brought back. That part of my story, unfortunately, cannot be rewritten, but yours can. You can be saved. You can live. Your family can be spared. This trauma, this devastation, please, please live. That's a message from a mom whose son's pain didn't end, it was simply transferred to her and many other people. You wanna know the best way to communicate to your family and friends that you love them, the best way to communicate that is by choosing to live another day. And I believe that you can. Choose to live today. And when you wake up tomorrow, you choose to live tomorrow. That's the best way that you can tell your family and friends that you love them. Now before I move on to the last Lie, let me say this. You know what the reality is, is that when, when some of you hear that suicide doesn't end the pain, it just transfers it, some of you think, you know what, that's exactly what I'm actually trying to do. That some of you have been so hurt, so wounded by someone else in this life that suicide to you has become the viable option for revenge. Let me just say, that is not the type of way you want to Deal with that. You leave justice to God. You leave it to God. That is not what you want your legacy to be. Suicide doesn't end the pain. It just transfers it and magnifies it in the lives of the people who love you. The third and final lie that we need to, to deal with is simply this. Things won't change. That's a lie. What you are feeling now will not last for forever. The pain you experience now will not be the pain you always experience. Emotions change. Emotions have to change. Emotions are constantly changing. So you need to know suicide is often an impulsive, yet permanent and irreversible attempt to deal with unbearable yet temporary pain. Let me just say that one more time. Suicide is often an impulsive yet permanent and irreversible attempt to deal with unbearable yet temporary pain. And I just wanna be clear, I'm in no way trying to trivialize what anyone in here is dealing with. Man, life can be extremely painful. But you need to know you don't have to end your life to end your pain. You don't, you do not have to end your life to end your pain. Things can change. Things will absolutely change, but I'll tell you where it probably is going to have to start. It's probably going to have to start with you sharing what's going on with another person. It's gonna be you stepping out of isolation and into community. The hardest part about it is that when you're struggling with depression or anxiety or when you feel suicidal, the last thing you wanna do is talk about it with anyone else. But the best thing you can do is be known by another person. 
It might mean grabbing a friend that you see here at church today. It might be telling your spouse or your parent. It, it might mean calling the, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline today. Some of you need to call it today. But it's going to require you to, to take a step. That is where change is found. Hope is real, it is available, but it's going to require you to step out in faith. And let me just say this, if you're here this morning and, and you don't feel like this message applies to you at all because you're not struggling with depression or suicide, let me just tell you this, this message applies to someone you know. I promise you it does. But you don't know it because our tendency isn't to share it. And so let me just ask you to be a great family member or a great friend to someone who just seems a little off. Like pay attention to what is going on with people. If you have family or friends that have been withdrawing from community, if they've been isolating themselves, if they've been exhibiting changes in moods and you're like my teenager every day, okay, that's, I get that. That's a part of adolescence, okay? But you still pay attention to that, if they make comments that express that life isn't going well, take these things seriously and ask, be willing to ask questions that they probably don't want you to ask. Like, hey, have you ever thought about taking your own life? Have you made a plan for doing that? Ask the tough questions, be a good friend. You have to remember that God often uses his people to lift up his people. Things can change, things will change. Let me just read you Psalm 40 verses one through three. I love this Psalm. But as I think about people in this room who are without a doubt dealing with depression and there are people in this room today that have had suicidal thoughts or suicidal tendencies let me just read you Psalm 40, and I want to encourage you to memorize this psalm because I think it is the breath of hope in our souls that each of us needs. Here's what David says. Let me read it from the NLT. He says this. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along, he's given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed that they will put their trust in the Lord. It's, I love this because this is David. This is one of the most important figures in the entire Bible saying, I know where you've been. I know what it feels like to, for him. His language was, I, I felt blinded. His language was, I was in the pit of despair. Some of y'all might say, I like that better than the blinded thing. Like, I feel like I'm in a pit of despair. He talks about being stuck. In other translations, it's the, it's the mud and the, and the mire. And, and some of us feel that way, that we just feel stuck in the mud in life, that we feel like we are drowning in, in despair, stuck in a pit. David is saying, I have been there before, but I'm not there any longer because something has changed. And the change agent in my life has been the God of the universe. Because David says what God has done is he has put a new song in me. And I love that wording because music is so important to us. Music is, is what communicates our emotions. If you think about it, like, do you ever have those times where you're listening to a song and it takes you to a different place? You're, you get nostalgic or, or it evokes some type of mood in you because music is often the soundtrack of our souls. And David says, he put a new song in me. He put a new song in my heart and in my mouth. You know what it means that David was singing a new song? It means that there was an old song that he was singing when he was in the pit. I wonder what song your soul is singing right now. Maybe the song of your heart right now is nobody really cares. Maybe the song of your life right now is suicide will end my pain. Maybe it's, 
things can't change, you need to know that God can put a new song in your mouth. He can put a new song in your heart. Jesus Christ can change the soundtrack of your life if you will let him. The message of the gospel is Jesus died so that you could live. You do not have to die. Jesus wants you to live. That is why he came, so that you could live. Let me just say this. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this message this morning has been about taking your life. But the message for you this morning is that Jesus wants to give you life for the first time. Because if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then you need to know the soundtrack of your soul is that you're physically alive, but spiritually dead. And Jesus wants to change the soundtrack of your life to be you were dead, and now you're alive. Because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Would you let him change the soundtrack? Would you allow him to put a new song in your soul. When I talked about suicide at Breakaway, the week before I talked about it, I just announced that I was gonna talk about it, and so during that week of preparation, a student, without me asking, he just reached out to me and said, I wanna share my story with you about attempting suicide, and I wanna share it with you now because it's a beautiful picture of God putting a new song in someone's mouth. He says this, he says, I was 16 when I attempted to take my own life. My parents were finalizing their divorce and had been at each other's throats for months, and much of that anger and bitterness had been projected onto my sisters and I. In addition, my first brush with heartbreak had just occurred, and as a teenager, I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, as cliche as that sounds. I had left home to spend a month in Mississippi working for my uncle, doing construction work and land surveying. And before I had left, I began a new relationship with someone else, and three weeks later, about a week before I was set to come home, I learned that she had cheated on me with a close friend. I felt betrayed by her, ignored and unloved by my parents, and inconsequential to my uncle. Overwhelmed with the emotion and pain, I picked up the pistol my uncle kept in his truck, and I put it to my head. I made up my mind that I wanted to die, and that was the only way to escape my circumstances. I squeezed the trigger three times to no result. Infuriated, I opened the revolver to see what caused the malfunction. I found two empty chambers and a misfired round. Through tears and screams, I began to reload the firearm, and as I did, my phone started ringing. My best friend from school was calling me to find out when I'd be home so we could go fishing together. And as I answered, he immediately picked up on the fact something was wrong. He asked, and I told him about my plans. I apologized repeatedly, and he calmed me down and talked me back off the ledge, so to speak. He invited me to come to church with him when I got home. And when I went, the message was about how I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And to drive home the message, the scripture explaining how Christ's strength is made perfect in our weakness was presented. I was overwhelmed by grace, and I'm so grateful that my almighty father saved my life through my friend that day. Fast forward 10 years, I'm engaged, self-sufficient, and more optimistic than ever, all because the good Lord decided to intervene. Isn't that incredible? Let me just end by saying this in light of the letter I just wrote you. I didn't write that, the letter I just read to you. (laughs) If you are here this morning and you are struggling with suicide, if you're here this morning and you're contemplating suicide, then consider this morning a phone call from a friend. Consider this morning a phone call from a friend. This isn't a phone call from TA to you. This is a phone call from God himself through me to you saying you do not have to die. Jesus Christ came that you might live. See the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Things can change. People care. God cares. 
You don't have to end your life to end your pain. Change is possible. But I promise where it's going to start is with you taking a step. Let's pray together. Let me just ask you in this moment as you sit there to just figure out how this message applies to you because it does in one way or another. This message is for every person in this room this morning. If you're here this morning and you just feel down, depressed, lonely, or overwhelmed, or maybe you've even contemplated suicide, if that's you, before you leave this place, would you just ask God for the courage to tell somebody? And would you even ask God right now, God, who's the person you want me to tell? What do you want me to do? Maybe, it's, maybe he even prompts you to call the, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline tonight. And maybe you're not struggling with those feelings, but you know someone who is. And maybe there are just more ways that you can press into their life. And so would you ask God even right now for the confidence and courage to be a good friend or a good family member? And if no one comes to mind, maybe you just need to say, God, would you give me eyes to see? Would you give me eyes to see the people around me that are hurting? And would you use me to put a new song in people's mouths? Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful for who you are and what you've done. Thanks that you've been right where so many of us are at, that you have experienced sorrow to the point of death. And yet your words were Father, not my will, but your will be done. And so I pray that that would be our words this morning. Father, not my will, but your will be done. God, I thank you that you are the giver of new songs, that that is what you're in the business of doing. You're in the business of changing the soundtracks of our lives. And so I pray that you just have your way in this place this morning. We're not trying to manufacture a moment here. We're, we're trying to do honest business with our thoughts and with our souls and ultimately with you. Would you have your way in each one of us? And would you do a good work in our lives? In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stay here a minute. Um, you know, I've been here 20 years, and just a handful of times when I'm sitting in the room, I just have come to recognize that feeling that, that just, it just kind of comes over my shoulder when I can just sense the Holy Spirit is really at work. And today I had that, and I'm having it right now. And I just want to stop for a moment, and, and I want to ask you, not to rush out of this moment because I just feel like God has been making a call to any number of you, either for yourself or for your loved one. Maybe it's your spouse who's not even maybe here or your parent or your child. And, um, and so here, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to sing one more song and I'm going to ask you I'm going to ask you, first of all, thank you. That was just an outstanding message. Yes. Why don't you go on that side? I'm going to go on this side, and we're going to make ourselves available. Some other prayer partners are there with their red lanyards. Um, in a moment when we stand, why don't you come and you just say, would you pray for me or would you pray for my loved one? And let's do something today. Let's just not go out and just say, well, you know, that was, this is a moment that we need to not just rush past 
and the prayer partners have, as do some of the people out in the, in the atrium, they have this little card that they put the, the numbers up there. So you can get it and you can take it and you can give it to somebody if it's not you that needs it, but you have somebody that you, I just felt like God told me to give this to you. Um, but let's just keep going with this moment. Um, as Jack and Lizzie lead us, why don't you just stand and let's sing and you come as you feel led right now. Let's pray. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Good afternoon and welcome to Postscript. I'm Tyler Riley, high school pastor here with Timothy Atik, executive director of Breakaway. So TA, thanks for being with us this afternoon. Absolutely. Uh, So you just wrapped up a two-part series called Tough Stuff. Today was on the topic of suicide. Um, So we do have some questions that came from that sermon. Great. Figure we could just jump right into it. Awesome. Sounds great. Good. So the first question is this, uh, how do I give hope to a friend who has wrestled with depression for 30 years? Yeah, good question. I think that the the greatest encouragement that you can give to anyone is to is to be willing to make themselves known and to invite and to invite other people into what's really going on. If it's been a struggle for thirty years, you know what? That I I even mentioned in the talk that I have a personality that leans toward depression. That doesn't mean that I'm wrestling with it all the time. It just I know that that can be a potential problem and and that could be this person's case for all of their their life but i would encourage them number one if they've never talked to a doctor about it hopefully in 30 years they have if they haven't they need to talk to a good doctor just to see what's going on but the best thing they can do is consistently share what they're feeling with other people so um i i'm always a big fan fan of Christian and biblical counseling to go and and seek help from a professional, but also to have good friends who are consistently on a weekly and at times even a daily basis asking the hard questions of, hey, tell me what you've been feeling today. Let's identify some of the lies and let me be a truth teller into your life and let me speak words that will bring life and hope. So the best thing is, the hardest thing is when you're struggling with depression, you don't want to talk to anyone. But to say, I'm going to ask you questions, and when I ask them, you're going to respond and you kind of don't have a choice. Right. Absolutely. That's good. Uh, Well, the next question is this. How would you counsel a parent or loved one of a person who has committed suicide? Yeah, that's heartbreaking. And, you know, I think, I think what I would share with you really comes from the letter that I read during the talk right. today from a mom who lost her son. The, th- the, the thing that's been so encouraging about my friend is that she's been willing to talk about it, that she's acknowledged the pain. And she, you even heard in the letter, she shared all of the emotions that has come with it, including anger and you know, and and also sadness and also feelings of guilt, like it was all in there. And I think that's been therapeutic for her to be able to share that with other people. This isn't something that you need to hide or deal with it on your own. You need to let people surround you and you need to have people that you can be completely honest and share things like, I am angry at my loved one for taking their life. And to not be embarrassed by that, but to say, look, this, this isn't normal for me to have to be dealing with. And so the feelings that I'm feeling, I don't even know how to process through them. So I'm going to put them on the table and, and, to, and for, to have people in your life that can say, I'm not freaked out. I'm yep. not scared by what you just shared with yep. me. Makes sense. And thanks for sharing. And let's, let's pray. Here's some words of truth from the scripture. But also to say, you know what? Don't be afraid to seek help from a... Yep professional to go to counseling and to to let someone ask you 
questions and, and to process through it. So starting with the embracing of yeah, the realness of those that's feelings. That's right. Absolutely. Well, uh, during the sermon, you mentioned that uh, on the topic of suicide, that it is a sin, but yeah. it is not an unforgivable sin. It is not the unforgivable yeah. sin. Um, and so the question comes in is this, if suicide is forgivable, um, how would one confess and repent? Is it not necessary to do both in order to receive forgiveness? Well, <clears throat> this is really a question about <clears throat> how is a person saved. This is a question about salvation. And, you know, uh, Romans 10 tells us that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, you look at the book of John, and it uses the word believe over 80 times. Um, you know, 1 John 5, 5, you know, 11 through 13, it says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write this to those who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. My point in sharing that is that salvation, which justification is the big Bible word there, which means to be declared right standing before God. That is a moment in time event. It's a once and for all event where when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God makes you new. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, the old is gone, the new has come. At that moment, Jesus Christ deals with all of your sins, past, present, and future. So salvation isn't, doesn't hinge upon your repentance and confession of every single sin. If that's the reality, I would imagine that there are countless sins that I've missed in my life that I haven't, that I've failed to repent of or confess, even the small ones, the, the things that we would classify as small sins. Thankfully, God's grace covers over all of those sins. Is repentance a part of the, the Christian faith? Absolutely. We're called to repent. Are we called to confess? Absolutely. But we are called to do those things as those who have already been saved. We don't do those so that we will be saved. Right. Right if that skin. makes sense. Absolutely. Well, that's all the questions that we have. Yeah. Uh, again, thanks so much. It was a great series. Um, and thanks for being here. It was yeah. good to have you back. You bet. And thank you uh, for being here today. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.